Hello and welcome to the AM Film Podcast, episode 11. Uh, I'm Brad Evans and with me is the editor, creator, mastermind behind the Angry Microwave.com, Callum Moran. Hello, Callum. Hello. I'm still very disappointed that you don't introduce yourself as master of film. Because after doing a master's and paying as much of, of you in money and time, I'd be going around saying I'm the master of film to everyone. Problem is, uh, if I say I'm a master of film, people would check out my YouTube page and... <laughs> are, you, are you subscribed to my YouTube page, by the way? Oh, I think so. I haven't seen anything on there. Is there some quality okay. uploads recently? Don't, d- yeah, but it was more like... Anyway, <laughs> ignore that. Do not search me on YouTube. So yes, this is the film podcast um, hosted by The Angry Microwave. Um, kind of, what is The Angry Microwave? It's a website, which is where there's about one thing uploaded every month. But we also do a podcast and we have a YouTube channel. And we do things like this. I mean... Oh, it was going so I'm really well. selling it, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is the podcast. We do have another podcast where we focus on everything from gaming, TV shows, music, um, everything that we're interested in. Uh, really, this is the film podcast where we specialise... Uh, specialise? Uh, where we discuss <laughs> uh, film topics, as we say. This is episode 11. Um, so I guess it's always a good way to start the podcast with saying, Callum... What have you seen this week? So, after last week watching The Polka King for the first time, I decided to watch the documentary which inspired the film. And it's really fucking weird. (laughs) So, so there's a narrator that sits in a bar with a pint for no explanation telling the story. Like, he's not, like, related to it. He's just sitting in an empty bar. And the documentary is a bit shit. It's like, so, a few weeks ago, I watched Foxcatcher, and then I watched Team Foxcatcher after. So I was kind of hoping it would be on the same level, but it really isn't. So try and avoid the documentary and just watch the film. I mean, it's all true. I haven't actually heard of this documentary. Yeah, it was... I I think it was a massive thing. I think it was a HBO-produced thing, but um, I just had Jack Black talking about it in a few interviews. He did it at Sundance this time last year now. Right. Um, So I was like, I'll wait for the film, then watch it. But, I mean, the film's great, documentary isn't. So Uh, It's it's a shame, isn't it, I guess, because it is such an interesting subject matter. Um, and it's a sad story as well. Um, so it's, it's a shame if I haven't done that uh, justice. I'm glad you've kicked things off in a, a positive light. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this week I watched um, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later on because there was a, a new story floating uh, about that film. Uh, also this week um, I introduced my girlfriend to Les Mis. Have you seen Les Mis? I've not seen Les Mis, which is very surprising okay. because I love a good old musical. It's interesting. Uh, I saw it once at the cinema. I liked it. Um, I liked the third act. Uh, I think it builds very well, uh, the film on second watching, uh, second viewing. But <laughs> the opening 15, 20 minutes is bad. Um, it's, it's a very bad opening. The problem is Tom Hooper, I think, is a, a fabulous director. Start with his standards, um, but he moved on to bigger and better things. Um, he recorded the singing live because he wanted it to be as theatrical as possible. And on a, new, like a number of occasions, that works out very well. Um, but in the beginning, like it's so breathy and it's such a big action piece that, that you just can't, you literally cannot understand what's being said. And for people who now have kind of obviously missed the big uh, hype surrounding Les Mis, if they are watching it for the first time, maybe not knowing what it was, I could see people getting turned off in the first 15, 20 minutes, which is a shame because it does build into such a fantastic film. Um, so yeah, you have, so you haven't seen the the musical or the the film. I have not, but but does this fit into the Hugh Jackman extended universe of the <laughs> Prestige and the Greatest Showman? Well, you know what? One of his first lines in this film I picked up on was, "This is not a circus." So <laughs> I'd say so. I'd say so. Um, but yeah, if you do watch it, um, get past the first fifteen twenty minutes if you can, because uh, it does build into I think a fantastic film, but. The first act is a bit of a mess, which is a shame because it's rich with some incredible uh, performances. Have you actually seen the musical? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, well, that's got that part of the conversation. Have <laughs> <laughs> uh, you seen anything else this week, John? Um, I saw The Last Jedi again. Uh, my opinion kind of remains the same. I'm still not a fan of it. I was hoping that second time viewing, I would either love it or hate it, but I'm still undecided. It's, it's, it's a thing. I don't right. know. It's, it's um, crazy because I obviously we watched it together. Um, midnight screening we both walked out feeling a bit deflated after watching the film um, second viewing I've, I 
loved it a lot more, like to the point where I actually loved it. Uh, but I haven't seen it a third time, and the reason that's a big deal is because if I love a film, I tend to watch it three times. Like first time, obviously on the initial viewing, because I want to see a film. Second time, um, if I'm interested in like a repeat viewing to pick up more things, the third time just to enjoy it. Uh, I haven't seen it a third time. Um, I'm not sure if I will. Um, but that said, I generally think this is going to be a film that in about 20 years, I think we're going to have a better viewing of whether people do love or hate this film. Because at the minute, I think it kind of, did, I think it kind of depends on how the third part of the trilogy plays absolutely out. Absolutely does, yeah. I mean, yeah. like most second films have that problem where either they're universally loved or they're being undecided on, mm-hmm. and it takes that third film to kind of secure its place in all the story. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because the people who love it tend to deny the fact that there are many people that dislike it, and the people that dislike it are in denial that people genuinely love this film. Whereas I think it's kind of a 50-50 split, in my opinion. I've heard some critics say that majority of people like the film. I don't think that's true. I do think it's split down the middle. Um, but I, th- I think I think time will tell. Maybe in a couple of years we'll sit down and watch it in Blu-ray and thinking, why did we not love this first time around? I also saw Disaster Artist, which I didn't love as much as I thought I was going to love. It right. seems very cameo-filled for the sake of cameos. just wasn't my kind of... Like, like, I love the concept of it. I love the trailer, but it just felt like a, a kind of like a Channel Five movie, kind of that had, had that kind of vibe. Yeah. I reviewed it on Letterbox, and my review was it felt like a high budgeted SNL sketch. Exactly. Um, it literally did felt you like that. Watch the post credit scene. I did not watch the post credit scene because I was going straight into Star Wars, which had already started <laughs> at that point. <laughs> no, I missed it. Tommy Wiseau uh, turns up in this weird, uh, like post credit scene, um, which I had to cut out of the movie. Because Tommy Wiseau can't change his accent because he can't do accents, <laughs> so it was basically two Tommy Wiseaus in one scene, and it got quite meta. Uh, but I, I haven't seen it myself um, because I went to the toilet, <laughs> so I didn't stay around to watch it. Uh, Callum, you ruined my segue into the next uh, topic because <laughs> we were going to stick with Star Wars. So, That's reverse. Han Solo. Ties in episode seven. Spoiler alert. Um, we're getting an origin story. Um, which is supposedly being released in May. So a feature film being released in May called Solo, A Star Wars Story. We haven't had a trailer. Do you still think it's going to be released in May? And have you read the synopsis for the film, which was released a couple of days ago by the US Star Wars? You mean the synopsis where it gives literally no new information? Absolutely, yeah. Once we find out, we found out that Chewbacca is in it. And we found out that he meets uh, Lando. So... (laughs) I don't know. You mean everything that was revealed in the leaks, like promo art for some cinema? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> are, you, are you are you worried for the film at all? Uh, I'm not as worried as I was. I mean, Ron Howard seems to be very confident in his approach, and and I reckon that was probably part of the marketing to get him posted on Instagram to kind of hype people up again. I don't. Th- I think it will come out in May because I think they would have not said anything until they moved it, but to bring out a synopsis. Bearing in mind the synopsis I didn't say anything. I think it was more of a kind of like it's definitely coming out in May. So here's this tiny bit of information to kind of reinforce that. Because if a date wasn't on it, hundred percent would not be coming out in May. But it was a bit of no information, and the most and the most like compelling bit was the date. So I reckon that that's the reason yeah. why they've done this and public and published it. I mean, on the one hand, it is nice to not know everything and not having seen. TV spots daily, not having seen new trailers every couple of months. Um, but I think we both know, and we should acknowledge that the lack of marketing for the film hasn't been because they want to keep it a secret. It's because the film has been a mess, and I think th- they know that. They know the public knows that. So I'd rather have a good trailer later on to get me excited about a film that I'm not particularly interested in, and a film that I don't want, <laughs> truthfully, um, as opposed to. Like a, a bit of a, a messy trailer just to keep the public happy. I think one of the biggest things is I didn't realise till the other day when I was looking through the release schedule that the Jurassic World sequel comes out two weeks after. And bearing in mind they're both potential billion dollar movies, two weeks is a really tiny gap. Yeah. And I think given the, um, as we say, the, the split opinion, not only from the previous Star Wars film and The Last Jedi, but the fact that there's there's no buzz. For this film, people are more interested with, are interested in how much of a 
amass the whole production has been seen. But then again, that works for World War Z. You know, that film was notoriously messy. But that film had time to move around. I think it had about three years, like, in production. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, (laughs) maybe slightly different. It it wasn't really reshooting, like, six months before it was coming out. Like, they they only wrapped about a month ago, I think, or it was when they wrapped which is six months before it comes out. And, and with the amount of visual effects we still probably have, that is a stupidly tiny amount of time. Mm-hmm. And also, I don't really get why they would be scared to push it back because they're going back into their home territory for, for, for releasing on over the past two years. And, like, they've moved other films back. Like, Force Awakens was moved back originally. Episode um, episode 9 now was moved back originally. Like, it's not a big thing because they've pushed, back, they've pushed films back and it's worked for them. Yeah, um, and especially as you say, like Jurassic World is going to make a massive dent to the box office. Um, I mean, you look at the uh, the box office results for uh, Jurassic World, one of the highest grossing films of all time. Domestically, it's like one of the highest grossing films ever. Um, and I also think that um, Jurassic World is more of a, you don't need to know the backstory to go into it. Mm-hmm. So you, I think families are more likely to go to Jurassic World more than Han Solo if they're both on option at the cinema. And I think actually that's where the um, the, the trailer for Jurassic World, I think was uh, Jurassic World: The Fallen Kingdom or whatever it's called. Uh, I, I think it was a very smart trailer because it it didn't make it out to be like this this sequel where you had to know the backstory or you had to know it was a bunch of dinosaurs are on the loose. I mean that's that's essentially what the film is, and it doesn't have to be more than that. It doesn't have to be built like this epic sequel. Um, it's just another edition of the you know Jurassic World. Um, filmography and you know I thought it was a good trailer I also think that Star Wars may be slightly burnt in that it's spin off before was Rogue One mm-hmm. it was quite a heavy war film so if you're kind of expecting that going in again which I don't think it will be I think it will be a, a comedic kind of heist film but the, gen- but the general audience will probably go think it's going to be more of this like niche spin off when it's actually kind of a comedy heist film so I think it may suffer from that previous reputation of their spin offs being quite dark talking of box office okay no, that was my segue. It could have been. I, that wasn't as good as I thought it was in my head, to be fair. Um, <laughs> we're going to be talking about Jumanji. Uh, and the reason we're talking about Jumanji is because um, I think it was Variety that are reporting that it's now um, number one for third week in a row, um, which is, you know, great by anyone's standards. But it is now approaching the top 60 highest grossing domestic films in American history. Um, what do you think? Are you surprised? I'm 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 quite surprised because this had the potential to be absolute shit, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it kind of proves that if a film can like succeed yeah. and have its own merit and be brave and going forward, and and to be fair, Jumanji it did not rely on the original that much. I mean, it had the name, but it wasn't like having like scenes of Robin Williams in all the trailers like some films would have. It kind of it kind of it kind of allowed itself to be its own thing. I think it's done really well from that. Yeah. Um, it's in terms of quality. Um, I enjoyed the film. Um, I thought it was funny enough for me to to walk out feeling you know, positive about it. Uh, I don't think it was groundbreaking. Um, I thought the chemistry was great, um, but the fact that it's you know kind of it's only going to obviously make more money. It's not going to lose money. Um, so the fact that it can reach even higher and it's going to break the top sixty, I, I think it's an incredible achievement. Um, and Dwayne Johnson. A lot of people wasn't too sure how this film was going to play out uh, in the box office because of what happened with Baywatch. But I think now we can put Baywatch down to being a bit of a blip because he really is, as they call him, you know, box office Viagra, isn't he? Like he's he just he's he injects so much new life and you know revenue into a franchise that I think it's it's crazy. I kind of think this goes on the back of the whole Instagram Ron Howard vibe because mm-hmm. all, all what we saw on The Rock's Instagram throughout the past year was all these Jumanji reshoots yeah. and everyone was really excited about that and as much as there isn't much buzz for Solo I think Ron Howard's definitely improved it from where it was in June when they first announced it was all going to be yeah. resh- reshot and everything yeah. so I I think it's kind of like new age of digital marketing which is getting really sad now but I, I do think it's getting really interesting about how these stars are being very upfront about how the production is going yeah. and, and just having this like view from behind the window yeah the, the thing is like i think dwayne johnson's smart like he interacts daily on on twitter with fans and other celebrities he posts almost hourly on instagram um 
you know, and again, like he's frank, like he'll make jokes about how nobody saw uh, Baywatch, and he'll, you know, take the piss out of himself for that, which is great because, you know, he's he's not like a normal media exec. And let's not forget that he's a producer. You know, he's got a financial stake in these films because um, his uh, production company Seven Bucks has a big hand in a lot of what he makes. Um, like he's he really is like a twenty four seven marketing machine, as you say. And I think also, he's a big part of that. Yeah. I also think he really un- well the, the director really understood how to use a character in that film because Jack Black was the only person I could imagine being in that role. Oh, that that um, that was a stroke of genius, I think. Uh, but I think and even- Jack Black's also got a big part to play uh, in the box office success uh, of of Jumanji because I, I think people have been crying out for this kind of Jack Black, like this outrageous, over the top Jack Black, which we haven't seen in quite some time. I mean, he was in Goosebumps, and, and then Goosebumps have really well the box office as well, and the sequel's coming out later this year. Mm-hmm. So it kind of shows that when you put Jack Black into these like main character roles, he, he can sell a film. Like Obviously, he can do his niche films like Bernie and The Polka King, but when he comes to box office, he sells, he sell, uh, he still sells tickets. <laughs> he <laughs> sells she <laughs> shops. Oh, I, yeah. I got that as well. Okay. <laughs> but, like, um, and even to an extent, Kevin Hart. Like I'm not a massive Kevin Hart fan, but that, but he was fine in it, and he didn't over, he didn't overdo mm-hmm. it as much as I thought he was going to. And I, I do think going off the, you know, come off the back of the previous film, Central Intelligence, um, I think which was a film that they did okay at the box office, but people that did like that film or liked elements of that film, most of them talked about the dynamic between the two of them. And going back to what you said about marketing, like they they can play off each other for days, like they what they literally do. Like they're, they're well, such they were great, a great on the Graham Norton show. I, me- I, me- I remember the episode now, and that was like about three, four months Absolutely, ago yeah. when they were promoting that. And, and, and I remember the banter going back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like they, like their promo tour seems like it would be a joy to be on. And and often you'll see them being really bored on the sofa. But these two really do work well with each other. Yeah, like when selling the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've you've seen the film, right? Yeah. Yeah. Will we see a sequel? I guess that's the, the billion dollar question. Given the financial success, I thought the film wrapped up nicely. Given how these characters, Dwayne Johnson and Kevin Hart, actually, you know, how they come to be in the film, won't give spoilers away, because obviously it's still on uh, in cinemas. But given the fact that these characters aren't in the real world, um, they're, they're in Jumanji, uh, can you see a, a film happening, A, um, because a, you know, a studio green lights it, or B, because you know, if we like, if we do see that, will we see these characters return? You think they've got to, right? I don't know. I, I think it's bound to happen, but I think they may do a, a, a new set of characters, maybe, and then and then like maybe have an intertwining story, right. which would be quite interesting. Like like if they maybe meet like throughout the same time period and they're doing the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But you kind of need those characters to play against type again. Yeah. So I mean, I'm not really sure who you could get. Like who would be like the most like maybe Jason Statham. Can't, and having that like Jason Statham as a character playing against his type right. would be really interesting to see. Yeah, I think the worry about that is it becomes a film, uh, it, it becomes a franchise that becomes almost predictable because you expect these characters, to, uh, these actors to play against type. Um, but uh, but again, yeah, it was the best part of the film, wasn't it? Um, could you could you see it being uh, given the green light for a sequel? Yeah, I mean, like it's it's a big enough name, and 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 they've shown you can reinvent it, kind of like the like, maybe there's a thing like we haven't thought of yet that they can go to the next level because this isn't really like anything to do with the first one, but it's in that universe. Yeah. So so if they could reinvent mm. somehow to yeah. get to the next one, that would be really interesting. Like like maybe it could be video game characters in the real world. Yeah. And maybe yeah. something like that about like there being like real like characters like trying to do, like being in everyday life i don't know yeah well i definitely agree with that i I don't really view this as a direct sequel i see this as being like another installment into what's essentially a serial you know it's just another rendition of this kind of world but it's reimagined and reinvented um i mean there's a couple of nods to the original which is nice um but yeah if they want to do a sequel the best thing for the story would be to have new characters Maybe the worst thing for the box office <laughs> is to take away uh, Dwayne Johnson and co. Uh, but we'll see. Time will tell. So, from one surprise to a controversy. Okay. The, the segues are something else this week. What's that, sorry? <laughs> the segues are something else. 
<laughs> I've started with so much confidence and I just don't know where I'm going with it. So, three billboards outside Evan, Missouri. Uh, a film that you've seen, I believe? Yes. Yes. Uh, we'll talk about this very briefly because it can, it can become uh, quite a, a touchy subject. Um, but uh, a lot of uh, websites are reporting that there's backlash um, to three billboards because Sam Rockwell, um, who I think transitions really from being like a secondary character into being one of the main characters, um, and that's actually part of the problem is that he's essentially a racist. Like he's a racist, a racist character. Um, the controversy is that some people see this as kind of uh, almost being sympathetic, uh, giving sympathy uh, to a racist character. Um, one thing that I will say is that I, I can completely see where people are coming from, and people are more than within their right to be offended by something. I studied on my master's, not being pretentious. Uh, I spent a module <laughs> studying the sympathetic racist. Okay, So the way that I look at something like this is that it's deliberately, and it's written in such a way, uh, where it's, I think it's very smart in that it provokes different reactions from different people depending on their political beliefs, their, you know, their, their faith or, you know, their background, whatever. And that's where a lot of people, I think, fail with the sympathetic racist character. Um, but you look at, for example, a Tony Soprano, okay, he was a racist, he was a homophobic, but we never wanted that character to die. We were always rooting for him because he was the opposite to what, at least in my opinion, he was the opposite to what we were as people. And that's what made that character so interesting. Is I mean, the film's about the journey more than the yeah. end destination. Absolutely, like, yeah. And he definitely goes on a journey throughout that film. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's it's a bit like watching Breaking Bad and, and then go, and going, oh, I don't agree with this show because he's a drug dealer and he gets worse as a drug dealer as he goes yeah. on. Like it's for it's for that journey of that character, and you don't always have to love the character to enjoy the experience going along, yeah. and seeing them develop mm-hmm. for better or for worse. Yeah. Uh, I, I I think it's certainly a, an interesting um, topic, but again, one to well, first of all, it's difficult to talk about because of the subject matter, but also <laughs> secondly, it's difficult to talk about because we don't give away spoilers. Um, but it's, for me, it's an aspect of the film that worked. I thought it raised some really interesting questions, um, but I can see why some people. Uh, had some difficulty with it. Leading on from that, it won um, Golden Globe for Best Film. How do you feel about that? <laughs> this is the thing. I saw Call Me By Your Name this week also as well, which has got a lot of buzz. And I just haven't been taken back by any films as I have been in the past few years. I mean, like, there's been Birdman, which is really out there. Um, Moonlight, which was, re- again, really out there. Well said. La La Land. And all these films had an effect on me. Mm-hmm. But I haven't really felt like it, they've all been really good films. Don't get me wrong, but like they haven't had that like wow, this is an Oscar film. This, this is something different. Like, like you kind of get what I mean. Like they're not really like yeah. different to what we've seen in the past yeah. like few years. And I think I, I mean it's going to make for a way more interesting race this year in the Oscars to see who does win. Absolutely. But this is nothing that's really stuck with me that I'm really rooting for personally yet. And I think I've seen all the big contenders that I think I would like. I mean, obviously, I've certainly seen The Darkest Hour, but that seems to be more of a character kind of piece, more than a yep. masterpiece of a film. So, Yeah, going going off that, um, I think that's why there's a bit of a backlash against Three Billboards winning Golden Globes, because I, I think a lot of people just don't appreciate that film, which is fair enough, because I'm not saying that they're wrong to not appreciate it. I'm not saying they, they didn't get it, because it's clearly a film as we say, with the subject matter, isn't going to hit a lot of people in the right places. Is there a dog behind you? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to mute, I was just going to mute my mic. How is there a dog behind you? <laughs> All the time. Good you can't do a podcast like Nolan in the room. <laughs> <laughs> He's our third guest. We always have three guests on. <laughs> That's true. Oh, it just scared me. I thought there was some kind of like poltergeist <laughs> behind you. Um, but no, I, I personally, it's... I, mean, I think it's a five star film, in my opinion. Like, I can't remember. In fact, the last time I walked out of a, a movie theatre, feeling like a film has impacted me that much, <laughs> I've upset now, um, <laughs> is The Revenant. Like, The Revenant, I loved so much that I saw it three times, as I say, you know. And 
if I could, I'd watch this film again and again. That's how much I I took away from it. But that's the beauty of film, isn't it? Like it's it's kind of split opinion. But as as you say, the great thing about the awards race this year is that there is no clear cut winner, which is interesting because how often have we seen, you know, films be you know it's going to be either A or B. You know, these are the the two films battling out, but. I mean, the the Oscar nominations are being released in a couple of days, and I can't even tell you what films are going to be nominated, let alone which ones I think are going to win. I mean, you should have listened out for our Oscar podcast, which we may do this week. We'll see. (laughs) I don't think you can guarantee (laughs) that. (laughs) One podcast a week so far. But it it is really interesting. I'll I'll, I'll have a ruined your segue. Yeah, it's fine. I'll come back to it. (laughs) (laughs) It is going to be really interesting to see how it goes. Um... But yeah, nothing's really stuck with me this Oscar season so far. I'm also quite intrigued to see what the nominations will be because obviously soundtrack for Greatest Showman because The Greatest Showman isn't particularly renowned as a great film but it's got a really big public like backing behind it. Yeah, I actually think that you could take a, about four of the songs from that soundtrack and nominate it for, um, for, for Best Original Song. In fact, This Is Me is the one that's getting all the buzz and all the accolades at the moment. But for me, that's... It's probably my third favourite song on the soundtrack. Yeah, Come Alive is my, yeah. my favourite, the one it starts yeah, with. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it really sets the tone to the film. And also, I, I kind of think that it suffers from the songs kind of all being like the same kind of tone, yeah. but, there, but there's enough difference between them. Yeah. But I don't know. One thing I actually took issue with um, in The Great Show is I thought some of the sound mixing was perhaps even rushed or misjudged. Like, in the cinema that I was playing, I think I said this in the podcast last week, but... Like on the cinema that I was in, like I I couldn't hear half the lyrics. Um, I've I've actually found the same problem with um when, when I listen to it on Spotify, um other streaming platforms that are available. Um, but it could be because I'm deaf in one ear. Maybe that's it. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I, I I took issue with that. Um, but anyway, I went on a bit of a. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a bit of a tangent there. <sighs> Talking of uh, Oscar season, this week uh, we have quite a few films being released that you'd imagine would be there or thereabouts because in the UK a lot of the Oscar films get released in January. Uh, so some of the most notable films being released are Downsizing, 12 Strong, Early Man, The Last Flag Flying and Maze Runner, The Death Cure. Uh, any one of those films you want to see slash want to talk about because you saw it at an early screening. <laughs> <laughs> um, Last Rack Flying is being released. Shamefully, it has it in under 25 cinemas. There was a and a event today, Sunday, when we're recording this, which is streamed to some cinemas. But it's just, it's just I, I just can't believe it's not having a wider release. It's got Brian Cranston, Steve Carell and Lawrence Fishburne, all Oscar-nominated actors, mm-hmm. I believe. With Richard Linklater, an Oscar, an Oscar <laughs> nominated director, and it just seems to be getting swept under the rug. I mean, it was it wasn't like the reviews are really bad or anything. Like the reviews were like three or four, three, four or five stars. They were very between that. It wasn't like it was all two stars or all three stars. So I'm just really surprised it's not having a wider release and wider buzz. Like you thought, like these would be the kind of people that would be on the Graham Norton show promoting their films. Because I mean, Brian Cranston's in London at the moment doing a play at the National Theatre Network. It's brilliant. Go and see that as a side thread. It's on to March. But it, it, I, mean, I was kind of surprised that there's not been as much promo or buzz around it. I mean, I, obviously I'm a, I'm a massive Linklater fan, so I'm going to have that kind what? of investment in it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just really surprised that, given the calibre of people, like everybody wants some, his last film, didn't have that cast. So I kind of get why that was kind of like nice being a little kind of small film that was in cinemas for like a couple of weeks. But this seems to be getting a smaller release than that, and I'm quite confused to why. So, are you? Are you do you think it deserves a, a bigger release because of its star power, or because of the quality of film itself, or a bit of both? I I think it's both. I mean, it, it's a perfectly fine film. I really enjoyed the film, and it's it's a really good journey, and it's got a really interesting message behind it as well. Once you see it, so I, I'm, and also like the star power is. I mean, I I think it's got a better selling than Twelve Strong. Which has got Liam Hemsworth, I believe. One of them. <laughs> but um, but then again, the cinemas are getting really full this month because it's got all these Oscar films, and then it's got like Twelve Strong, Early Man, which is an animation, 
um, and Maze Runner, like all these massive films that probably require taking up quite a lot of quite a lot of screens. Yeah. And obviously, Star Wars, has, Star Wars is still are still in cinemas. Um, you got all the Oscar films. It's Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> There is just so much in cinemas yeah. at the moment that I've kind of think it's getting crowded, and I think it would have benefited from being released back in November, October time when there was less out, because this film was because this film was never going for the Oscars, like it it it, it doesn't need to be here. Yeah, you know, I I agree. I mean, I I do want to see downsizing as well. That's a film I don't want to see, but I'm not hearing really anything being said about it, which is always a bit worrying because. Of, you do worry, don't you, this time of year, what kind of January film it's going to be. Is it going to be an Oscar January film? Or is it going to be a film that people... Sorry, a film that studios have put out in January? Well, I also played at London Film Festival, and the buzz from what I heard wasn't particularly great. Apparently, apparently it's a great concept, and the, and the first act's really good. But it just ends up... I, not, I, I haven't seen this, but uh, apparently it kind of ends up being a film that it never set out to be. Oh, okay. From what I've heard. Mm-hmm. So it's quite disappointing because the trailers, I really, I've really enjoyed seeing the trailers. Yeah. And I'm really sold on the concept, but it kind of seems to be misrepresented in that kind of way. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for killing the dream there. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Maze Runner, I didn't know they were still making these. Um, well, the guy on set about two years ago had a major accident. So it's kind of ruined their every year kind of push because they had to literally stop stop production for like nearly a year okay so they could start filming again it's, it's really bad is he well so that's why that's kind of, yeah no he's okay now okay. but like but, but uh, 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 yes yeah, so, so it's when it happened apparently it was a bit of a mess in the whole thing so they had to shut it down okay so that's kind of lost momentum and also that's is it going to be an imax because I, I i know it's going to be an advertising imax but well, if humans can get an IMAX release, then I'm sure anything can. Uh, <laughs> so we'd like to end these podcasts with a recommendation or something that we personally recommend for you to watch, which you inevitably don't. Uh, so, Callum, uh, what's your uh, recommendation this week? So um, I've talked about it in the past few podcasts, the final year, the documentary um, focusing on Obama's past year in the office and people behind him that's um on demand now for people to go and watch or go and see it or go and see it in the cinema it had a vod and cinema release day and date what's it released so on highly recommend. what platforms are on um i think i think it's on amazon it's on okay. all the stuff where you can buy stuff google play okay so yeah go and see it and let, and let me that. know what you think <laughs> i will i will uh my recommendation this week is going to be three billboards we talked about that a little bit throughout the show um I, it's a film that personally just hit me just right. Uh, I'd love to hear from people if I, you know, to see whether I am a loner and no one agrees with me, or whether other people also feel like it's possibly um, undervalued. Well, that's difficult to say undervalued when it's winning awards, isn't it? So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Woody Harrison is worth watching that alone for. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think everyone's great in it. From top to bottom, I think everyone's great in it. Uh, so that would be my recommendation uh, for this week. Uh, I've gone with uh, non-Asian cinema because I know no one's going to check out the films that I recommend <laughs> <laughs> otherwise. Uh, so yeah, that would do it for episode 11 of the AM Film Podcast. Uh, Cam, is there anything you'd like to say before you leave forever? <laughs> forever? <laughs> forever no. You know what, if I die in the next week, this is going to be a very suspicious snap, isn't it? Yeah. Um, just go and check us out um, on theanglymicrave.com or, and subscribe to us or wherever you do if anyone listens to this to be fair at this point we could just be speaking to a void and no one would know I so. don't understand what you just said <laughs> what did you say <laughs> we could just be speaking into a void with no one listening back, oh I so. don't know I mean we average at least two likes per video so <laughs> crazy <laughs> but yeah uh, do do check us out we, uh, we've got a cracking website that uh, Canon runs um, we do host podcasts as regularly as we can um we are hoping to do this more regularly. Um, if people do support us, uh, feedback would be great as well. Um, but thank you for tuning in, if you have. Uh, if you haven't, then Callum, thanks for joining me. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. And until next time. <laughs>